From 1967 until 1970, the breakaway Republic of Biafra fought a civil war with Nigeria. The subsequent Biafran famine was one of the first African disasters to receive extensive media coverage. Due to it taking place during a time when much of the world was starting to have access to a television, the famine brought about the conflict that would claim the lives of anywhere from 1 to 3 million people. It was a conflict that was framed around the world in a myriad of ways. To some, it was about religious rights, freedom of oppression and self-determination, whilst others saw the conflict as a threat to their investments in Nigerian oil. In today's video, we will cover the events leading up to the Biafran Civil War, the fate of the short-lived Republic and how the conflict shaped international recognition of such breakaway states. It is perhaps helpful to start with how the state of Nigeria was formed. As with much of Africa, it starts with colonial borders. In this case, Nigeria as a unified country was formed from the two British protectorates from northern and southern Nigeria. These two protectorates were born of colonies along the West African coast, formerly key slave trading posts, but would become instead vital to expanding British trade and influence in the region. The amalgamation of the two separate protectorates was not done for any other reason other than as a means to deal with the budget deficits of the North by using the surpluses of the South. As was often the case, little concern was given to the tribal and ethnic groups who were now forming the new country. When Nigeria gained independence from the United Kingdom on October 1st, 1960, it held a population of over 45 million, who were from no less than 300 differing ethnic and cultural groups. In pre-colonial times, the largest group in the north was the Husafulani, in the west was Yoruba, and in the east it was the Igbo peoples. At the point of Nigerian independence, these people lived all across Nigeria, each of these ethnic groups well represented in the larger cities. A further generalization can also be drawn as to religion, with Muslims predominantly living in the north and the Catholic Christians in the east. Many political parties were created based along these lines. The first government was led by Abu Bakr Tafawa Baliwa. Abu Bakr was a northerner and his government was largely seen as corrupt. Conditions between the working classes and the ruling elite were stark. All the white British investments in the region boomed. For example, the British-owned United Africa Company was responsible for 40% of all Nigeria's foreign trade, most of it being the hundreds of thousands of barrels of oil that were being produced each day, and most of this coming from the East. During the 1964 elections, ethnic and regional differences were emphasised as part of the campaign. Politicians were often targeted, fearing for their life whilst campaigning. During this time, the Teve ethnic group in the Banu region pushed for self-determination. But they were crushed by the army, with hundreds killed and thousands arrested. This example of the Teve agitation being crushed by the army highlights how the army was often used as an internal police force. In January of 1966, a number of Nigerian officers, many of them of the Igbu ethnic group, launched a failed coup. Though this did result in the death of Prime Minister Baliwa, along with other leading politicians. After the coup was defeated, martial law was declared, with Major General Johnson Agui Ionsi taking control of the country. Suspicion soon abounded that the Igbu president was spared by the conspirators, as he happened to be on holiday at the time of the coup. Disquiet soon led to another coup in July of 1966. One of the key reasons for which was fear of Igbu revolt within the military. Anti-Igbu attacks soon escalated to the point where massacres were taking place. Anywhere between 8 and 30,000 Igbu were killed, resulting in around 1 million Igbus fleeing to the east of Nigeria. In an escalation of violence, northern Nigerians were also murdered in the Igbu-dominated east. Thousands of Husafalani, Tiv, and other northern ethnic groups were massacred by Igbu mobs, in turn resulting in such peoples fleeing to the north in a massive population shift. Colonel Odomegwu Ojuku, the military governor of the eastern region of Nigeria, 
was part of negotiations to avoid all-out war with the northern ethnic groups. The Aburi Records were signed in January of 1967 in a bid to establish the Nigerian constitution and to recognize the military. The accord would not hold the peace for long. The military rulers of northern Nigeria were not willing to concede any ground to the east and instead sought to fragment the region into three separate states. As the accords fell, the Republic of Biafra broke away. On the 30th of May 1967, Colonel Ojuku declared that the Republic of Biafra was formed, seceded from Nigeria on a unilateral basis. This was immediately met with a huge embargo by the Nigerian government, both to and from Biafra. The only thing that was excluded was the export of oil, though this soon was also restricted when Biafra was able to start collecting revenue from the oil companies within its borders. Few countries chose to recognize the Biafran Republic as a legitimate state. Only Zambia, Tanzania, Gabon, the Ivory Coast and Haiti. Whilst France would go on to supply arms to Biafra, it never recognized it as a state. In July of 1967, the Nigerian army launched their assault into Biafra, though its army struggled to make much headway. The Nigerian army had little to no armored vehicles or tanks, a small air force, and a navy of half a dozen ships. The initial attack by the Nigerians included two columns, which captured the Biafran towns of Nusuka and Gakum. However, the Biafran army responded and mobilized quickly, crossing the Niger River through Benin City and making it only 130 miles from the Nigerian capital city of Lagos. The to and fro soon turned against the Biafran forces who were pushed back. At this point in the war, the two forces were locked in a stalemate, unable to make any meaningful advances or sufficiently repel the enemy forces. Nevertheless, the Nigerian forces were able to close a ring around the Biafran Republic, capturing Port Harcourt on the 19th of May 1968, a major supply route. Bridges were destroyed and access to the sea was blocked. Between the subsequent blockade, the reduction of the Biafran territory and the higher concentration of people in ever smaller borders, a humanitarian crisis began to take hold. In 1968, it was clear a crisis was afflicting the people of the Biafran Republic. Information and accounts by missionaries spread the word that famine was imminent. Humanitarian disaster with starvation soon setting in for Igbu civilians. Once the ring was closed, civilians were often subjected to airstrikes and artillery strikes, killing thousands throughout the conflict. With the blockade restricting food, a major problem arose. A condition named kwashiorkor, or a protein deficiency. Prior to the conflict, imported dried fish from Norway was the main source of protein for those in the east. Once the supplies ran out, those within Biafra were living off almost exclusively carbohydrates. Missionaries soon noticed mothers fleeing, often carrying children reduced to living skeletons yet with bloated bellies, a key indicator of a protein deficiency. At the height of the famine, an estimated 3,000 to 5,000 people died each day, a great many of them were children. Very quickly, the humanitarian issues were brought to the fore and shown as a key component of the war. The Biafran Republic justified their struggle for self-determination, insisting that the Igbu people would be threatened with genocide if they remained in Nigeria. This was seen as a strong possibility by judging how the Nigerian army was conducting the blockade. A number of volunteer groups, many of them Christian groups, established ways to provide the Biafrans with food by means of an airlift, which was now the only way to deliver aid into the Republic. The offshore Portuguese island of Sao Tome would become the staging ground for a volunteer air force that would transport medicine and food. Although these efforts managed to get in some aid, weapons were sometimes transported in by the humanitarian airlifts. In addition, gunrunners would disguise their planes as those delivering food, which only increased the mistrust between the two sides. At this point in history, much of the Western world had never seen photographs of malnourished and dying children. When the pictures were published in the newspapers, 
demonstrations and matches took off all around the world. Several charities around the world picked up the plight of the Biafrans with fundraising efforts carried out by the likes of Oxfam, the Red Cross and the Peace Corps. Some of the co-founders of Doctors Without Borders, Bernard Couchner and Max Recamier were also present as Red Cross doctors. It was their experiences witnessing the murders of civilians and seeing the effects of the famine that led them to speak out against the Red Cross's apparent complicit behaviour and support of the Nigerian government. It is even reported that some Nigerian officers were even quoted as saying that starvation is but one of the weapons of war and that if children are to die, then it is, quote, too bad. It was not just foreign NGOs that assisted during the civil war. Both sides utilised mercenary forces to supplement their own. The Biafran Republic even put together an air force formed from a number of foreign pilots and a small navy to assist with the supply runs. As for support from other states, many chose to aid Nigeria for a number of reasons. Britain was eager to protect the investments in the Biafran oil fields and were very much under the impression that the Biafran Republic could not last for long. However, as the Nigerian army was largely under-equipped, Britain began to supply weapons and intelligence. They also assisted in arranging for mercenaries to join to speed up the Nigerian victory. The then Prime Minister Harold Wilson denied all involvement in arming the Nigerian army, likely due to public outrage at the suffering of the Biafran people. Whilst France never officially recognised Biafra, they did provide weapons, notably captured German vehicles from the Second World War. Ireland was also a country that gave its support to Biafra. They recognised their own plight in the Biafrans, a nation eager to form their own country and one that had experienced a horrendous famine, and both predominantly Catholic. But generally speaking, many countries were not so eager to recognise Biafra as it could embolden other ethnic groups to unilaterally break away from their state. As the Nigerian army grew both in its size and in its arsenal, the Biafrans often resorted to using Obungwe, a series of improvised weapons. A research group was established to create weapons to even the playing field, with notable examples being a surface-to-surface -surface missile capable of destroying tanks and a series of landmines, which when used in conjunction were able to halt any Nigerian advance. Whilst these were effective when they worked, the technological disparity between the two armies only grew. It's not hard to see why the Biafran Republic would fall on the 15th of January 1970. With massive military aid, notably from Great Britain, the stalemate was eventually broken. Colonel Ojuku fled by plane to the Ivory Coast. Now was the time for reconciliation, with Nigerian General Gowan stating the now famous quote that there were no victors, no vanquished. But those Igbos who returned to their homes often found their properties now occupied by others, with little option than just to accept it. New laws were passed to avoid political parties being formed along ethnic or tribal lines in the hope to avoid such events again. Much was done to emphasise what united Nigerians rather than what could separate them, but the impact of the war was stark. Around 100,000 soldiers perished during the civil war, and anywhere between half a million to three million died due to famine, with thousands of minority ethnic groups murdered by the Biafran and Nigerian armies under the suspicion of fighting for the other side. Whilst the Biafran Republic failed to establish itself fully and failed militarily, it was successful in highlighting the famine that raged within its borders. It galvanised much of the world to its plight, achieving visibility on the international stage. Whilst many may not care for or understand the ethnic and tribal conflicts in countries they know nothing about, it is hard not to be moved or to feel compassion for emaciated starving children. Biafra is today very rarely discussed and often forgotten. After all, the conflict was dwarfed by the Vietnam War, which happened at the same time. But its relevance is in the politics of declaring independence from a host state, and how a humanitarian crisis can galvanise the people of the world to a cause, even if countries are not willing to do so.